All right. Now we're going to have all the adults sit down, all the kids stay standing. All elementary, middle school, high school stay standing. And uh, I'm going to invite all the middle school guys to come up here and stand up here in front, the front of the stage here, all sixth grade through eighth grade. Look at all of them. And then we have all the high school youth over here on this side. All the high school come stand over here. And then all elementary age kids, we're going to come have you come gather here in the front, in the middle. All elementary age kids. Now look at this, folks. This gives you a visual of what God's doing in this church. I didn't have them come on the stage because then you wouldn't see me. <laughs> you guys can stay there because we're running out of room up here. We, we as a church have really embraced the calling that God's given us that there's what's now called the 414 window, which is that research has shown that kids are most open to the good news of Jesus Christ between the ages of four to 14 years of age. The 85% of adult Christians made a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ when they were between four and 14 years of age. And so we are all in as a church to minister in this community to children and to middle school and high school kids. And I thank God for the leadership of Seth and Erica that are working with the children and for Derek and his team that are working with middle school and high school. And I thank you guys. Let's give them a hand of appreciation for their work. Man, you high school guys, you're just way too tall. You're way too tall. So I'm going to give a, a word of uh, encouragement, admonition to the parents. This is from Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4. Okay? This is what we are partnering with you to do with your children. And God said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, not just in your mind, but down in your hearts, meaning it's supposed to be what you live with and for. And it says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. And so we'll put that in a modern context when you drive down the road. Speed limit. Right? And when you lie down and when you get up. Meaning your job as parents is to raise up these precious young people in all the ways of the Lord, and we are just partnering with you to make sure that we do that so that when they become adults, they don't depart from that path that we put them on. And so I think uh, in light of the, the nature of the world today and the, and the messages that these kids are being bombarded with, trying to lead them away from the source of life, which is Jesus Let's pray for them. Can we do that? So can we extend out a hand of blessing over these precious commodities? Lord, 
when I look out in front of me, God, these are your children that you love. And God, you had them in mind, every single one of them, even before they were conceived in the womb, that you have given them a name, you have called them to be your own, and Lord, you have a destiny and a purpose for every one of their lives. And you're calling each one of them to follow you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, we pray that you would protect them from those voices of the enemy that would call them to lead and follow another direction. And we pray that they would hold true to your truth of who you are. We pray for a feeling of the Holy Spirit that they have experienced your manifest presence in their life, that they will know, that they will know, that they will know that you are the way, the truth, and the life and that they would be willing to stand against the norms of the culture and that these young people would go forth and be leaders in their generation, leading their generation to you, and that they would be world changers. And we commit them to you, Lord. We, we consecrate them before you in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, have your way with these children. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. amen. Yeah, those baptisms last Sunday night, it, it, to me, that's what it's all about. And uh, it just wrecks me every time we do baptisms that people's lives are being brought from darkness to light. And, uh, and you guys are doing an amazing job changing this community. And, and thank you for partnering with us to do what God's called us to do. And... Uh, you know, one of the, the great blessings that I have in being over in the ministry for uh, a number of years is relationships. And uh, the people that I've been able to meet and uh, have life with and share in ministry together with has truly been the greatest blessing in the lives of Jane and I. And uh, about 13 years ago when we were in Canyon City, this good-looking, red-headed Norwegian guy walks into the church and uh, met him and his wonderful family of three kids. And I say, hey, let's go to coffee. And so we went to coffee and I just kind of shared our vision. And, and he, for some reason, uh, he's probably pretty naive. He stuck around. And uh, he eventually came on staff with us. And I just saw that this guy has incredible giftings, way better than mine. And so Corey... Sandro came on staff with us. It was our associate pastor, and uh, Corey and I had a blast working together. And really, the, as the church grew in Canyon City, it was really because of Corey. It, it really wasn't because of me. And uh, when we left and came here, actually, uh, it was on the 6th of August, just a couple of days ago, was the sixth anniversary that Jane and I landed back into Grand Junction. It's hard to believe it's been six years. And uh, so, really, the hardest thing of leaving Canyon City was leaving, working with Corey and Julia, because we really did become soulmates and just had so much fun working together. It was to the point that we could just give each other a look, kind of like married couples. I mean, I'm not getting weird on you or anything, but <laughs> anyway, Corey and I just kind of would know what we're each thinking. And, and we would just kind of do what we had to do. And, and it was really a fun uh, time of ministry. And so now, fast forward six years of us moving here, it's kind of funny that now Corey's my boss. He's, he's our regional leader. And we are so thankful in our region that Corey's been elevated to this position. And um, I just asked Corey, Corey, would you come to Canyon View and I just can't believe it's been six years since I've asked him to come. I should have been done doing this every year. And you will see why as Corey comes up. He has a great message to encourage us as a church to do what God's called us to do. So would you please extend a warm hand of appreciation for Corey Sandro and him coming here to be with us. I told Kirk earlier that my mom would have loved that introduction. <laughs> hey, come back. Oh, 
I like I said earlier, I'm your regional leader. You got to listen. Go back. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, um, and uh, I, I, you guys are kind of famous, honestly, in the region. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But um, six years ago, when Kirk and Jane came and said they got a call to come here and stuff, it was really, um, I hated you. <laughs> and... Well, I've worked through that now with lots of counseling. <laughs> and uh, anyways, my, the, the, like this weekend in Canyon City, we're going to baptize uh, probably about 85 people this weekend. And, um, and that's, what, that's what God is doing. And I tell people, honestly, after Kirk set up a foundation of a church in Canyon City, a monkey could have came in and let it to grow and reach people for the lost. Because honestly, he set such a good foundation. It was really solid, it was really clear, it was a clear vision to reveal the love of God, restore relationships and release people into their ministry. And, and I just want you to know that I think that I see from afar that you guys have helped him to set that same sort of foundation here and what's before you at this church and to reach people in love is really quite extraordinary. You know, you're in the forest. What is that saying? You can't see the trees in the forest or whatever? You can't see the forest. The well, trees. you can't see anything that's too tall. But, um, <laughs> and so um, as someone outside your forest, I just wanted to encourage you that you're doing an amazing job. And, and uh, since Kirk's come, I think there was one vineyard church six years ago, and now there's like six. That's God. God's doing stuff. So, anyway. Anyway, I, I, my, my, my church said, they didn't say, hey, go check on Kirk. How's he doing? They didn't really care about that. They were wondering, um, what do people in Grand Junction think of Kirk? Yeah, that's what they asked. And so, here's, here's no, 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 don't clap. Um, I mean, I think, and... I want to hear some words, because we're really relaxed in Canyon. This is, we're all just all part of a team. We're going to explore scriptures and see if God wrecks our heart today. But what are words that you use to describe Kirk? And I want you to throw out those words, and I'll bring that back to Canyon City. So how do you describe Kirk? Humble. Okay, what else? Sincere. Did someone say firecracker? Did you say that? Is that what that is? Yes. A humble, sincere firecracker. Um, <laughs> what over here? Faithful. Faithful. Welcoming. Welcoming. How come no one's saying Asian? <laughs> they need glasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, what's that? Personable. Personable, yeah. You know, I think what's important as you reach Grand Junction Valley Mesa world here, um, <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> that um, the more authentic and the more gentle and the more real we can be, the more non-religious but super spiritually faithful in Jesus, that you're gonna see a lot of things happen. And um, I'm thankful, because I didn't want him to go, that you have welcomed him so well and you've honestly taken care of Kirk and Jane and the kids. And I just wanted to say thank you and thank you. I love you. Okay, so in Canyon City, what we do is like, never is someone on the stage that's like, has it all together, <laughs> and, and like, okay, here we're going to talk, and this is how you should be. Those days are over in church world, because anytime a pastor says, here's how you got to do it, be like me, they usually fall. And so what we do in Canyon is we just say, all right, let's explore together. We're just normal, regular people, and let's just see what God does. In 25 minutes, I believe it's possible that the Holy Spirit can come and is here and supernaturally change your life and mine. I think this could be a pivotal moment in the history of our life every time you come to church. I believe the local church does that. I believe the Word of God is a powerful thing that's alive. And you didn't come here just to check off the box. Now, some of you did. Some of you didn't want to come here, and you're here. Uh, let's just trust that God's going to do something. Does that sound all right? And then let's expect that. So Holy Spirit, come. Oh, my coffee's really good. The Holy Spirit came. Um, what I love about the, uh, the vineyard, you guys, just so you know, is that a vineyard's not into titles or positions or anything at all, to be honest with you. They're just regular people. And Kirk should have been the regional leader. But here's what he said. The short of it is this. He said, you know what? It's not the season in my life to be the regional leader because I need to focus on my family. 
That's what he said first. That's a good leader. That is families first. Secondly, he said, it's not time for me to be the regional leader because he's more equipped and he's a great leader. But he said, I got to focus on my flock, the church. This season of my life, it's about my family and Canyon View and investing as much as I can into those groups for the glory of God and the well-being of people. He actually turned down being regional leader because he wanted to invest more and focus more on you guys. And I think that's a humble guy that does that. I think that's a guy that's not into title or position. And I don't know if you knew that. You probably didn't. And so um, there, I just told you. (laughs) I think that what we want to do in the region is just love others in the name of Jesus, right? And that we're just normal people that have junk in the trunk. You guys know that term? Turn to your neighbor and say, you got junk in the trunk. (laughs) And at a certain age, if you don't understand that... um, you go, go outside. Hey, honey, we got, what do we got in here? Anyway, um, and uh, when Kirk did tell me he was moving to Grand Junction, the first thing I thought, honestly, my, one of my first thoughts, I was really mad at him because he's my friend and he's leaving me and I worked through that. Uh, and, and then I thought, who cares about Grand Junction? I mean, Canyon City is where it's at. <laughs> That's like hard to say. <laughs> Prison town. Anyway, uh, and, and it's like, and that was my thought, right? And, and, and then I realized what, what God has done over six years and, and before, uh, you know who cares about Grand Junction and Canyon View? God. He is like incredibly in love with you and in love with this church. You guys are famous. In the region, this is how the country split up. This isn't the main topic, I just want to give you a little heads up. Uh, the, region, the, the country in the United States is split up into 16 different regions, and then internationally there's 15 to 2,000 vineyards around the world, and, in, and then 700 or so in, in, in the United States. You're the Rocky Mountain region. You're part of a region of about 25 other churches, so we're all in the same tribe. Here's a little view, and you won't be able to see the pictures that well, but you see these, this is the, the region in the different churches in, the, in our particular region, part of Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and Nebraska. That's the part of the region you're from. You maybe didn't even know that. And it's really not that important other than we come together to reach more people in our region, as, as Jesus said, to go make disciples. So guess how many people attend church in our region probably today? Just roughly, throw out a number. If you get it right, Kirk will buy you a coffee. Great, perfect, 12,000. So 12,000 people in our region right now are gathering today to worship God and to extend the love of Jesus Christ, right? And you guys are actually famous in our region. The things that you have done actually is getting out there and encouraging other churches to do. And I'm not just like blowing smoke, okay? You're, You're, I think, the biggest church in the region, you have done things like the Kimwood Park and Racket Club apartment ministry, right? You got the backpack program for over 600 kids getting food. You feed the CMU students. You got a Palisade campus. You know, Ronnie and, uh, what's Ronnie's wife's name? Karen? Karen. Uh, you planting in Durango with DJ and Vanessa. We love those guys. They look super Norwegian like me, but I'm not sure if they are. And you got the South Sudan Initiative where over 4,000 people have come to Christ in four months. Are you kidding me? And you, you, you got uh, the VBS that you do. And, and I just want you to know that I know that's God working through you. It's not you. But, but what you're doing impacts the whole region. So when you get that little thing, like, oh, maybe I should get involved in that, or maybe I should help with that, you're creating something that the region is seeing and say, well, maybe we can do that. We are in the South Sudan Initiative with you. I would never have our church in the South Sudan Initiative if it wasn't for you guys, for Kirk and your missions effort. And it's awesome. So I just want to encourage you that you're part of a church that's that's really vibrant and thriving, even when sometimes you wonder, (laughs) and you're really making an impact on the region And in that as well, I just want to say thanks. So turn to your neighbor or or pat him on the back and say, you're such a good little church. (laughs) Now, I know Kirk's done that with you. So I could come up and talk about like, hey, yeah, we're going to do 25 more churches in five years and let's double our number of followers of Jesus and and some sort of Amway thing, but I'm not. (laughs) And that Amway's great, whatever. But... um, What Kirk asked was, Corey, would you come and share your heart with the people of Canyon View and for the region? 
So I'm just going to share my heart. It's not really scripted so well. My heart is this. In our region, and in the country, and in the world, and in your living rooms, and in your workplaces, and in your schools, and in your sports teams, there are people that are desperate to be invited into a new way of living that is super authentic and full of freedom in Jesus Christ. There are people that are disabled physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, socially, financially. They're totally disabled. They're stuck. They don't know where to turn. They're in shock. And they're just longing for somebody to invite them into something that's real. And that means something. They're not really that interested of being invited into a church building. They're invited into a new way of living. And so my heart is that we would invite disabled people into a new way of living like never before. And you and I and we would be the great inviters of this planet. Because when you invite them into and to see who Jesus is, man, things change. I mean, it's just the real deal. I got a friend, um, she works at the coffee shop. Do you notice we mention coffee shops a lot? Anyway, she works at the coffee shop in Canyon and she's a waitress and she's, she's really neat and she's been uh, free of meth addiction for 18 months and she's just happy and bubbly and, and she meets the guests and she's just like a ray of sunshine, right? And, and she said, I said, well, how did you get through? How did you go from a serious meth addiction, which is a big problem, used to be in Canyon, to, to free of addiction? I mean, any, let's just be honest. Anybody here ever struggle with addiction? Okay, right now you're like, oh, crap. Are you asking me publicly to admit that I did something that horrible or that hard or that struggling in the past? You'll see that it's critical we be vulnerable and transparent. It's critical. Because the world's not looking for a fake smile and a how you doing and bring your big black huge Bible. The world is looking for authentic, real people who have a broken story that God has redeemed and they're different. And purple and yellow Bibles, because that's the color of the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> and that is where from I reside. Anyway, so our, my friend, her name is Jamie, and I said, so what, how did you get from there to here? It's just crazy. And she said, you know, at one point, somebody came up to me and said this, and it changed my life. And this is all, it's nothing like major. They said, Jamie, you do not have to live that way. Jamie, there's another way you could live. It was that simple. It was like, her, she just like, what? I have a choice of how I can live? I can choose not to live this way? And, and with help, and with searching scripture and Jesus and a recovery program at the church, and she's been clean for 18 months. And she's reaching out to her friends and the meth addiction problem in Canyon City, especially teeth. What you'll notice now in Canyon City is that the teeth are looking better. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's a good one. No, it's real. There's less mess teeth in Canyon City because Jesus has authentically been invited into some people's lives and that's changing. All she, knew, all she wanted was an invitation into a new way of living. And now she's inviting people like crazy. So here's what I think we can do. My heart is that we would put ourselves out there and our stories and our reality of who we are and invite people where they're at to just be who they are, walk with us closer to Jesus, to look for people who are what I call disabled. I believe that everybody is disabled, everybody. And if you say, wow, well, how can everybody be disabled? Well, the quick, the quick of it is sin, sin disables. But Christ came to make us able and pay for that sin. So what you're gonna see in the theme now is that we are able in Christ. And I believe that all of us have had a moment in our life, like a divorce, or I mean, how many people have been divorced? Or we've had a kid get seriously ill or die, or we've had a miscarriage. Guys, you shouldn't put your hand up in this one. <laughs> or uh, how many people have gone into debt and it stresses you out? Or uh, you said something really stupid once in your life? Yeah, dude, you're my favorite person now, because he went like this, yes. 
And so my point is, is that we've done things that the enemy has meant to disable us to be used for God's purposes, plans, and for what he's called us to do. And we think, oh man, I did that, I can't do that, I'm full of shame. I had one woman who came up after church today and she said, I just can't tell you how much this has changed me that all you said was that God's not mad at you. And she just said, I just felt so much shame for some of the things I've done in life. And she just felt free. If we can reach out to disabled people, they will become able in Christ. Now, you might wonder, where do you get a heart for the disabled, right? And, and here's, where I, here's where it started. It was uh, our first kid. We have three kids, all of them, uh, all of them even the little girl is taller than Kirk. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and we've had one miscarriage, and you know, we were so excited to meet that child in the new heaven and new earth. And, and uh, when our first child was born, his name was Carter. And uh, he, we were excited, and he came, you know, he popped out. That's how it happens. And, uh, and uh, about five minutes after they're doing that app, app, guard, app guard thing, that test on how healthy they are, they just took Carter away. And they said, oh, we need to take Carter to check his health. And they just took him away. We were first kid. You're like, well, that's normal, right? I just, good, wash him up, because he's kind of gross. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, then they come back, and one thing leads to another, and, and they just, the doctor comes back in the room, and I, I remember the doctor's first word was, sorry. And I think back about the doctor's first word to me about my boy, my firstborn, I'm sorry. Because he had this idea, this doctor, that there's gonna be problems and challenges, and it's gonna break you and wreck you but God had a different plan. And so he came back in, he said, I'm sorry, your, your son has a really rare syndrome, and uh, if he survives over the next few days, which we're not sure that's gonna happen, he won't see and he won't hear, and, um, and his joints are gonna be inflamed because of the dwarfism he has, and he won't be able to move. So best case scenario, what we're looking at is a blind and deaf, unable to move child to care for. You know, my dreams of him being a basketball stud kind of left. And uh, God has allowed us to care for a boy and put in a heart of my wife and I that we have seen disable become able and used by God that we, I mean, it's not good. We're, my wife's a good mom. She's a good parent. I'm a dork dad. I blow it a lot. And so I wanted you to just soften your heart. This message isn't about Carter at all. It's a metaphor to what's happening in our life. And if you'd watch this video, you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about. Disable to able. Carter and I have an idea. What if all kids with disabilities were either healed or given the help they needed to be all God created them to be? What if every handicapped kid on the planet heard about how awesome Jesus is and then in an act of love were given a medical treatment or equipment to help them? When I was born, the doctors told my mom and dad that I might not live. They told my mom and dad that I might be blind, deaf, not be able to talk or walk. I was born with a purpose from God, but it wasn't clear at the time. I had many surgeries in my life. My legs were broke in five weeks in a row in an effort to fix them. My neck's been fused. My knees and ankles were straightened using an experimental technique the one we use on horses. God has given me many great resources. I go to store, I play in band, I edit videos, I have hearing aids, glasses, leg braces, a therapist, 
doctors, wheelchairs. I have a great family, a great church, and most importantly, a great God. The hardest thing about being handicapped is probably the feeling of being outside of the drill boy, not wanted a lot. The most painful moment in my life was probably during recovering after my net fusion and having to wear this big metal halo. It has like four screws, I think, going into my skull to hold it in place. One of the best things about being handicapped for me is that I can help people by sympathizing with their pain or and being able to share the love of Jesus. If I didn't have any of the resources I have right now, then my life would probably be a lot different and a whole lot harder. I really believe that people underestimate handicapped kids and that handicapped kids have great potential to be leaders in their communities. My name is Carter and I have an idea. Let's bless every handicapped kid on the planet that don't have the things that I do. Kids that get thrown away because of their deformities, kids that a set of braces or a wheelchair would help them get to school. So will you join me in helping the handicapped kids around the world by either praying for them, sponsoring them through Compassion International, or going on a mission and helping them personally? Or maybe even all three. I believe that by working together, we can help every handicapped kid in the world have a better life. Oh, and by the way, a note to all those who were around when I was born. I see, I hear, I walk, and I laugh. <laughs> <laughs>is that I believe that we have all in some way been disabled, and that's the exact thing that God wants to use in our weakness to bring his power to transform the world. That's so deep in my heart, and I, I know I gotta thank, uh, the, the, that, that film was, uh, it's kinda cool, because it's the second generation of Yamaguchi Sandro working together, so Wade Yamaguchi and Carter got together and made that video, and so that was kinda fun. You guys know Wade, right? He's, he's, cute little guy. And, um, and then what happened, you know, we just made it because I don't even remember why we had it. We had a Compassion Sunday or something in our church and, and, uh, and it kind of got out there on YouTube and then, um, and then John Piper got a hold of it. He's this pastor dude. He's, he's just kind of, in some worlds, kind of a big time guy. and He's got 500,000 people on his Twitter list and, and then he sent this video via Twitter to his 500,000 followers and, and this, this, this just kind of just God using a weakness to bring hope and encouragement. So I see and believe that the students and the people that have physical handicaps are actually our greatest leaders to be that we haven't tapped into. Here's why. Anybody that's had a physical disability that's here, you know that you've had some skill set you've had to use just to get through life. You've had to be perseverance, you had to uh, be strong, at times you had to be stubborn, uh, at times you had to have vision about what's possible when you could barely do something, uh, you had to communicate to help people kind of coordinate to get things that you need that maybe you can't get. You see what's happening? In the folks that have disabilities are the seeds of leadership. And what the planet doesn't have is enough people who've gone through hell and beyond that then move into leadership. So what we're gonna do is to try to invest in these people and young people and those that have disabilities and use that weakness to be leaders in their community.
That's kind of the vision. Here's one of them. Fred, if you want to put Fred up on the board, is a, is a soon-to-be leader. He's, he's not the white guy. <laughs> Fred is in Uganda. We visited. His legs are really messed up, and, and he scoots on his butt. He's got zero resources. But Fred is brilliant. I mean, he is funny. He's got a great smile. You just love, don't you just look at him, and you just love Fred, right? And, and he's a future leader in this uh, certain tribe in Uganda. You know why? Because he has had to be strong and lean on God just to get through life. And there are qualities in him that are so close to being leadership qualities. Fred is going to make a big difference. Kirk's disability. I mean, we joke about it. His dis- you know, he's disabled, right? Yeah. I'm just throwing it out there to see what they say. <laughs> One dude did it. He just went... Well, I'll be, I'm going to be honest. There's something disarming about Kirk and Jane and the fact, I mean, this sounds crazy, that they're a little shorter. It's like you can trust them. They're not intimidating. <laughs> um, they're likable. And they're people gatherers, and God's using that, right? You see, God, whatever your junk in the trunk is, well, we have to get to a place of instead of hiding it and being full of shame and like embarrassed about that divorce or embarrassed about that drug addiction or embarrassed about that time when you used to look at pornography or, and all of these things, you know, they better not know that about me. It's part of your story that God is redeeming to bring hope and encouragement to a planet that desperately needs real people with real stories. And it's you. Your junk in the trunk is beautiful if given to the Lord. Teens in here. Man, I know you guys are going through hard stuff as a middle schooler and high schooler and your parents have no clue at times and, and they love you, but like, what? And I try to sing One Direction to my daughter and she's like, Dad, stop. You know, we just don't get it sometimes. And uh, do you guys know who One Direction is? Okay. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? The, uh, the idea for you young people is that uh, I know there's been hard times for you just growing up in school. And I know that at times you feel inadequate or you're posing about trying to be all this and all that with a certain group of friends. And I just want you junior high and your senior high to know in this room that just who you are, just yourself and the stuff you've gone through is awesome. I mean, you are a masterpiece of God. And you don't have to pretend to be anything other than just you. And God will use that. So where do I get this idea? Because we better talk about the Bible or at church. <laughs> so in the Bible, there's this great, great story that we all know. And what we don't necessarily know is that this story is about a disabled person. Moses had a disability. Now, here's the story in the Bible. God shows up in like this burning bush thing, like supernatural activity and says, hey Moses, you're the dude and you're gonna go to Egypt, you're gonna take the people and you're gonna free them and you're gonna do it and it's, I'm gonna be with you and let's go, all right? And, and Moses answers, this is the moment, this is so cool. Moses answered this, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. So right in the beginning now, Moses is saying this, they won't believe me, they won't listen to me and they think I'm crazy. And that's the same thing we struggle with with sharing our faith and being real sometimes. They're not going to believe me. They're not going to listen to me. And if they do, they're going to think I'm crazy, Jesus freak person or something, right? Then it goes on to say, okay, so the Lord's got a plan. Here's what, here's what, here's what God's going to do with Moses. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some super cool signs here, some wonders, so that one, you step up, and two, so you know I'll be with you, and when you get there, they'll believe you. So God says, okay, take your staff, throw it down. And he said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a serpent or a snake, right? And when Moses saw it, he ran from it, the scripture says, which is really fantastic because if somebody put a snake like you, you look like a really strong uh, kind of guy. You throw a snake, you'd probably eat it or, but um, (laughs) that's what Kirk would do. And uh, at least when the snake is on the ground, most of us would just kind of go like this. You know, I think I would scream like a little girl. I'd be like, you know, that's what I'd do. And we just jump back a little bit. But what I love about Moses is what does Moses do? The Bible says there's a snake on the ground and Moses runs. Ah! Right? And so 
This guy, Moses, what I love about him is he's a scaredy cat. How macho and strong and brave and courageous, he runs from a snake. I always wonder, how far did he run, right? He run like a mile? Anyway, so this is true here, this is what I love. Moses is struggling with belief. He doesn't have the strongest face, honestly. And he's not that brave. If you've ever felt, man, I just don't have enough faith. I'm just not that courageous. Well, you're in the same boat as Moses. Grow a beard. So, <laughs> put out, okay, so he goes, he goes, he says, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. God says, so he does. He follows God's direction, puts it by the tail. He says, wow, that's awesome. And he says, that they may believe that the Lord God is their father, is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared to you. And the Lord gives them another sign. He said, if that's not enough, here's what you do. Take your hand, put it inside your cloak, put it out, and it's all leprous. It's like white and like disgusting. And it's like, whoa, and he can't run from his hand. Have you ever tried to run from your hand? Anyway, he can't. And then he says, okay, Moses, put it back in, puts it back in, pulls it out, and it's healed. Wow. He said, yeah, I'm a, you can do that in front of him too, just to show that I am real. It's crazy. And he said, and if they don't believe that, here's what you do. Take some water from the Nile in a little cup, pour it on the ground in front of all those dudes, right? It'll turn to blood. And they're going to believe you, Moses. I'm with you. Snake, leprosy hand, <laughs> blood on the thing. Let's go do this. And we're all thinking, what a dork, Moses, if you don't just go. Look at it. Because do we see these signs and wonders all the time? Now, sometime we do because God's still working and supernatural things happen. But we're, we were like, man, how could he not go? So here's what happens next. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord. Hey, this is where, oh, my Lord, that's where this comes from. <laughs> this is what Moses says. After all that, after the burning bush, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Even after all the signs and wonders from God, Moses says, yeah, but I'm disabled. But see, I, I can't talk real well. I ain't so good at talking, God. Something has happened to his lips and his tongue. And he says, I'm not worthy of this great mission. So many of us get stuck with what that thing that happened or who we are or that limit we have or that pride or that ego or you can't speak in front of people or blah, 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 blah. Like, Lord, you know, I can't do this. Then the Lord said to him, one of the most fascinating things in the whole Bible, and it's actually a tough pill to swallow. The, the Lord, the creator of all, said, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord, Sovereignty comes into play in the Bible in this moment. That God has purpose and plan even for those we're trying to pray get healed. Now this gets crazy. What? Wait, because we're a movement of going out there and Robbie Dawkins was just here and we're going to pray for everybody and they're all going to get healed. Absolutely. Because Jesus says later in John 9, 1 in the New Testament, he says, you know what? The disciples ask, why is this guy blind? And Jesus, what did they do wrong? And, and, and Jesus says, they didn't do anything wrong. It's for the glory of God. For the glory of God, this guy was blind. And Jesus goes and he heals him. And he says, go out and pray for people. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see people get healed and we're going to see people not get healed. It's a great mystery. It'll drive you crazy. Why is Carter, who I've prayed every single day of my life for, not healed as a dad? It has almost driven me to leave the face. But you know what? But God and his purposes. So now when I pray for people, it's really great. I actually have more freedom to pray for people because I'm not concerned what the result is that much. I have huge expectancy that they'll get healed. But you know what? If they don't get healed, I trust God's doing something. 
So I'm actually praying for more people because I understand that God's sovereignty meets empowerment. So let's just go pray for people because even if something happens or doesn't happen the way I think it should happen, God's got it. So it's like no lose situation. Start praying for people like crazy. You see that? So here's what happens with Moses. That was a side note. I didn't say that earlier so that you're supposed to pray for people, I guess. Um, now, he says, is it not I, the Lord? And then it says, okay, so, so, so God says, you know, who makes him blind? Who makes him see? All this kind. And then the next sentence, God says this. Now, therefore, go. <laughs> and Moses said earlier, you know what? I got this speech problem. I had it. And even since I've met you, I still have this speech problem. <laughs> Did you see that in Scripture? He says, you know what, uh, before I had it, and I met you, and I still have this problem. And I love this, because how many of us have had like this issue or this challenge, you've met Jesus, and you're still struggling a bit with that thing. Like God just didn't go, poof, fixed. Maybe because you haven't come to God and say, you know what, this thing, this embarrassing thing, this hard thing, this hurtful thing, instead of hiding it, and being shameful here, Lord, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give that back to you now. I'm just going to say, use me, take it. It's yours. So then it goes on to say, uh, now therefore go. And I, he says, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Isn't that cool? Now <laughs> Moses says this. It's great. After all that. Oh, my Lord. Please send somebody else. After all this, like, hello. Moses is still saying, it's not me. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm disabled. I don't have the faith. I'm not courageous. I'm not Kirk Yamaguchi. <laughs> now, this angers God in the story. <laughs> this is good, because I like when God gets angry. I don't know, it's just cool stuff happens. And, and, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, now, as a parent, if we get angry with our kids, that they do something wrong, what comes next? Punishment. Boom, right? No more Nintendo, no more whatever for four hours, whatever. But when you're angry, typically because someone's done something wrong, comes punishment. That's the typical process. But in this case, what God does is fascinating. He gets angry, and he says, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well, and behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he's going to be really happy in his heart, and he shall, you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I'm going to be with your mouth, and I'm going to be with his mouth, and we'll teach you both what to do. So I'm going to bring your uh, Aaron, and you guys can go do it together. Now look at this. God's really mad. So in his anger, he helps Moses. <laughs> In his anger, he brings someone to do it with him. I love this about God. If you've done something or said something or thought something or looked at something, Christ paid the price of God's anger and took the punishment on the cross for you and for me so that now we move forward after repenting and believing knowing that God is orchestrating the universe to help you accomplish things for his glory and the well-being of people. It's just how it works. I love this, that he brought Aaron with him because uh, there was a great study done, and uh, it was talked about just a couple days at another meeting, but um, that if you take, is an interesting study, sociological study. If you take a monkey and you put a monkey in a cage and you put all sorts of stressors on the monkey, lights and sounds and whatever, just to raise the heart rate and the nervousness and the anxiety of a monkey. And uh, if you do that and then you measure it and they got all these baselines, right? Then they did something next. They all the same stimuli, lights, sounds, scared stuff. Ah! And what they did is they brought another monkey the second time and put just simply another monkey in the cage. Two monkeys in the cage together. Same stimuli in the uh, experiment to get the stress levels up. Guess what happened? All of the factors were reduced at least by 50%. Stress levels, heart rate, anxiety dropped 50%. Same stimulus, same stressors. Why? Because he had a monkey buddy. <laughs> because he was with someone. And here's what God's doing. I'm going to bring you someone. 
to do this with you. I'll tell you what, if you don't think you're courageous enough or strong enough or you're junk in the trunks too bad or whatever, God's going to accomplish his purposes no matter what. And it's quite probable he's going to bring people around to walk with you in that. And you're not going to have to be alone. Do you see that? You see, they wouldn't believe and they won't listen to me and they'll think I'm crazy. Just a real quick ending graphic is this believe and then go to the next one where some things are crossed out. You see, because God is doing his things, because Jesus said, I'm gonna build my church, that Jesus is doing it, you see, people will believe. If we allow the worst things that have even happened in our life to be part of our story, and to be real and authentic, people will believe. And people will listen. And it's going to make them think about the great I am. I am is another name for, for God. It will happen and it is happening. And you guys are doing it. So here's my encouragement. I think we're all disabled. Physical, emotional, social, financial, all sorts of things, spiritual. But in Christ Jesus, the word disable fades to able. For God's glory and the well-being of people. And God is not angry at you. And there's more in front of you than you can possibly imagine as you give your stuff to God. Let's stand. Let's go ahead and stand. Even the thing you might be most ashamed of is one of the things God's going to use. Man, I was, uh, I was stuck once in my life uh, on illegal gambling on the NBA. So embarrassed by it. I almost lost my wife. And uh, then later, years later, he had me teaching gambling anonymous classes. <laughs> there was a boy on, and I just remembered this this weekend. First, mem I haven't had a memory of this until just this weekend. There was a boy at preschool where I went to preschool. I was age four. It might be one of my earliest memories. His name was Matthew Abbott. And we were playing on the jungle gym type thing, you know, at the preschool. And Matthew Abbott had two, he had two hearing aids. And he was bald and he was going through a sickness. What I did, because Matthew said his ch is funny, he said that chickens were chickens. And anytime he tried to say ch, it'd be sh, because of his hearing impairment. And I would tease Matthew and say, hey, why don't you come down the slide, chicken? There's this disabled kid who I could have reached out to. I could have befriended. And I'm the dude at the end of the slide, full of pride and arrogance and hell, making fun of him. I just thought, I just had that memory with you this weekend. And I wonder if that's why I will give my life that people who are disabled are equipped and able to change the planet. I've been forgiven for what I did to Matthew. I mean, it's a little thing, right? You've done similar or worse. I've been totally forgiven in Jesus Christ for that. And now, Lord, use that frustration or pain for your glory and the well-being of people. So if you'd close your eyes. Just a, what I love about Vineyard is we lean in, we share a message, we have Bible stuff, and then we say, let's do some work. Let's do some spiritual work real quick before we go. I love that about Vineyard. So just close your eyes and just think, right? You know, like, hey, you know, is there anything that comes to mind that you just, man, wish that would never have happened? Why did I do that? I really regret that. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why have I been divorced four or five times? Hey, just for those who've gone through divorce, side note, we have a campus in Florence, Colorado, and the pastor, the co-pastor with her husband, who's there right now, is doing great things. She's, she, she's been divorced four times. This is earlier in her life. 
She met Jesus, things have changed, she's new in Christ, and she's pastoring a flock brilliantly. What is it that you're a little embarrassed by, (laughs) that you're frustrated with, or you've been hiding, or covering up, or not willing to, I don't even want to think about that thing. And what I suggest is that between you and God right now, you just first of all say, Lord, forgive me for hiding something that's just happened in my life. And then uh, just in your own way, you know, like, hey, Lord, I just want to say right now, I give you permission to use that. It's like it's a little deal with God. Lord, I give you permission to use my brokenness and my pain and my suffering and my frustration. And I just, I just, Lord, say all my good gifts plus my junk, use it. Take it. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come and you just meet us all right where we're at as you invite us into a new way of living that is authentic and full of freedom in Jesus Christ. Let's take this moment. For many of you, it's emotional. I mean, I can see tears in the room and the Holy Spirit's doing stuff. And, and, uh, and if you're not feeling anything and you're like wondering about the ham, you know, that's okay. It's all right. This is a safe place to feel or even not feel. It's all right. But let's stay together and sing this song and then I'll, I'll come back up and we'll close.